what uh, my group is doing and uh, and then uh, different application of materials in catalysis in batteries and then towards a uh, uh, mechanoelectrical conversion so what basically my group is doing my group main strength is developing a new material so we are utilizing different uh, uh, synthesis approaches like a liquid metal based synthesis where we can develop 2d materials uh, with the ultra thin even up to a half a nanometer thickness sheet and uh, we can prepare a large up to centimeter size unidirectional uh, uh, crystalline uh, uh, 2d sheets and then we can develop their oxides sulfides even nitrides or phosphides whatever is the requirement we are also utilizing traditional senses uh, methods like a wet chemistry and a physical approaches uh, to develop different kind of uh, composites uh, uh, based on 2d 1d or 1d in uh, encapsulated with the uh, 0d uh, uh, developing and recently we also start developing different kind of a uh, heat pro structures we mostly use them in energy applications that is the main direction of my group and uh, we are also exploring a little bit towards them biomedical applications and the waste treatment and microwave absorptions so in energy storage we mainly develop on, uh, work on the developing a uh, different kind of uh, batteries like sodium potassium lithium and supercapacitors and hybrid devices made of a uh, battery and uh, supercapacitors we also uh, uh, work on a uh, water splitting to produce hydrogen and then uh, some catalysts for the fuel cells to convert that hydrogen into the energy and we are also working on thermoelectric and piezoelectric energy conversions in biomedical basically we do mostly collaborations and we develop some uh, biocompatible materials for the drug delivery or uh, uh, in vitro or in vivo disease detections and uh, some uh, targets for mri detections and uh, for wastewater and microwave absorption basically our idea is like uh, to develop some porous materials that can uh, clean our water and as well as protect us from a lot of like uh, microwaves that are around us due to this enormous uh, uh, advancement in technology. So we have a, this is a, a overview of our facility that we have at RMIT and everyone is, if someone is interested to work with us to collaborate or to just visit us, they are welcome to use these facilities. So now I will move towards uh, my topic. So if we, these are the two images of the most popular cities of uh, world. One is uh, from China, Beijing, and another is from uh, uh, UK. If we look at them, you, you can't see anything clearly. Even the buildings, high-rise buildings, you can't see them. They are high, we have a high pollution in the environment. So, excuse me, how we can survive in that such a situation? Is this a way? that we can put uh, masks okay we can put masks how about the other other living bodies on the on the earth so we can't put them mask on them as well so it means this is not the way that we can survive on this earth so how we can survive we have to get rid of this carbon emissions we have to find some alternative ways we have to move away from the fossil fuels we have to develop some alternative energy sources and even we are developing some alternative energy sources we need to make them efficient we need to make uh, prepare some backup for them so for that nanotechnology is playing a key role so i will discuss a little bit advancement of uh, my group we have put into developing different kind of materials in the various energy <coughs> fields so the first i will start with the hydrogen the water splitting hydrogen can be a most promising uh, green fuel that can have the same energy density as that of a petrol and that can replace it that can be utilized uh, directly as a fuel in the uh, vehicles to power the industry or it can be utilized as a storage site so if we have uh, some intermittent energy production systems like a wind uh, uh, or ocean tides or uh, solar cells we can use uh, that that energy to store as a molecular form into the hydrogen so but what happens at the moment if we are thinking that we need to reduce this uh, carbon emissions which are globally increasing not uh, the temperature not only the pollution so that's making the life difficult on this earth so we have to go away from the fossil fuels but the current hydrogen production is mainly dependent on the fossil fuels if you look like 96 percent hydrogen production is directly or indirectly linked to the uh, fossil fuels so it means even we are producing hydrogen that is not providing any advantage that we are uh, overcoming the issue of uh, carbon emissions. So then how we can uh, manipulate this one? So this is only the way that we, what we can do, we can 
utilize in green sources uh, of energy, like a renewable energy sources, and we use water that has a no carbon uh, in it. And when we use this hydrogen the, uh, to get a fuel or get a energy, the our product of this is also a water. So this means hydrogen can become a very useful if only we produce it from water and using renewable energy sources. So that's the only way that we can get rid of all carbon emissions and we have a green uh, fuel. But for that, we have many issues. So that required different kind of a, uh, like when we break water molecule into a, a, a hydrogen and oxygen, it required energy. So that energy is very high. Ideally, it should happen at 1.23 volt. That is still a little bit energy required. But when we actually do the water catalysis, uh, water breakdown or water catalysis, it required a lot of energy that goes much higher than 1.23. So if we are putting a lot of energy and we are getting less hydrogen, that's not an efficient system. So if we, we need to make it efficient, we need to do it at lower energy consumptions where the catalysts come. So catalysts helping us to do this at lower energy, but still these catalysts has a, a lot of challenges. With the best, at the current time, we have already gone through and developed a lot of better catalysts that can do this at, at a very low energy consumptions are close to the ideal situations, but all of that catalysts still have the selectivity. Some of them are selective for OER, like oxygen evolution reaction in water. Some are very selective for the hydrogen evolution reaction. And even some are very selective towards the medium in which they can produce. So still, it means they are, some are very good in alkaline, some are very good in estic mediums. So it means <clears throat> we need something that can do both reactions and in the same medium. Or at least, even we have a two different electrolytes, they can, uh, catalysts, they can do the catalysis in the same medium. But most of the OER catalysts, they are not stable in acid. And most of the uh, hydrogen HER catalysts, they are not stable in a, uh, alkaline medium. So that's the main issue that we need to overcome for them. And secondly, we are mainly using a fresh water. So we have to, if fresh water is only three to 4% of the total water available. So if we are using that water, the small water uh, to produce hydrogen, then how we will survive, how, what we will drink. So we have to shift from fresh water to sea water. So that is another hurdle because we have a lot of salts in the water. We have a, a lot of uh, uh, biological life over there, microbes, bacteria. So they are causing a lot of problems. So these are the some issues that are with the water splitting that we need to overcome. So I will just highlight like a few examples from my group. So we, we try to make some catalysts like metal oxides are very good for uh, doing OER. So we try to develop some metal oxides and we found that if we are developing mix transition and metal oxides, they are very good. Like we mix nickel oxide with the cobalt oxide. Simple mixing, but didn't give us very good results. What we found, if we have a nickel oxide and cobalt oxide, both are existing as an individual entity, but in the proximity of each other, they are existing close to each other. They are impacting their at, uh, oxidation states. So what we are getting, if they are close to each other, we are getting their higher oxidation state. If you look at the, our exhaust study, you will find when the nickel and cobalt oxide, they come to clo uh, close to each other, we have a shift in, in the peaks. And same thing we found in our XPS results that confirm that we have a higher oxidation of a cobalt. We have a more CO3 plus than the CO2 plus. So that giving us the more uh, efficient uh, oxygen evolution reaction. And if you look at that, we are doing it very, very close to what, what is the ideally required at very low over potentials and which is very stable. But what's the challenge with such a catalyst? How to industrialize, how to commercialize this product. If we, are, we can get something very efficient at lab, but if we are not able to translate into industry, then this research has no meaning. So what we need to do, we need to reduce it. So how we can reduce that one? We try then another way that, okay, the best thing that is required is the higher oxidation state. So rather than making something complex, can we find some way that we can still have a higher oxidation state and the simplest system? We found that we can create some metal vacancies. 
non metal vacancies is norm traditionally used but metal vacancies is a less used method when when we explored that when we found that still we are getting very high higher uh, oxidation state in our system the exof and the xps studies prove and then we did some dfp studies that also found that such a disruption creating a more favorable sites for the water molecule to absorb and perform the oxygen evolution reaction ultimately we found that they are even better than the what traditional uh, noble metals can do and very stable and very effective uh, to do the oxygen evolution reaction but oxygen evolution reaction is not only the overall water splitting so we also need some catalysts that can do the hydrogen evolution reaction so for that metal phosphides are very good so we recently tried to develop something that has a, a very unique surface because we need more catalyst sites to be exposed so we developed some some 2d uh, iron phosphide uh, phosphide because transition metals are always good so what then we did in the even in the uh, 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 on the sheets we tried to manipulate their surface area so when we are getting to the sheets with the different uh, uh, structural changes on it we found that we are creating some porosity we are creating this orderness in the structure and ultimately we found that they are performing very good they are approaching the performance of a noble catalyst and they are very active in their uh, in in reaction kinetics so but still we found like only making a disturbing the structure a lot or disordering making disorders in the structure is not the solution so then we do some further analysis and we found that mainly the electrochemical active surface area is important so that is not only related to the uh, uh, like a surface area of the material because sometimes we have a more ex surface area but its actual active sites are not exposed so the main thing that in material designing we need to look we don't need to only need to develop a material which have very large surface area because sometimes they create a many side reactions we need the actual active sites to be exposed so that give us like okay if we are doing some such engineering we can develop some better catalyst then recently we developed a catalyst that has a bifunctionality in it we try to again use iron phosphide because we know this is an active material but in our previous study we were not able to fully ex uh, execute its active sites to the surface we are not able to create some extractive sites so here we found that if we can create some strain in the material so that will be very helpful and then we did some surface modification that also help us from the material depressions so if you look here we have a, some surface coating we have a, a strain to the ring structure so the ring is hollow inside so uh, electrolyte can go easily into the structure and the uh, some uh, a strain at the edges or the curve of the uh, uh, ring is very uh, useful to create act extractive sites so when we apply it as a oxygen evolution reaction hydrogen evolution reaction in alkaline media it give us extraordinary performance and we found that this is the something very best in reported literature so that that's that's giving us the possibilities that we can develop a material which can perform both oer and hcl reactions in a single system so that's our next aim that we can further manipulate these materials increase their production to put them into industrial scale and then make their make them more stable to to be active in the uh, sea water rather than only in a fresh water so now i will move uh, quickly towards the some some of my examples similarly uh, towards the energy storage so like you know we have a different kind of energy storage devices we like uh, fuel cells we have a uh, uh, traditional capacitors and we have some batteries in between so what's the difference between all of these devices fuel cells are very good to store energy they give us a higher energy density but the rate they give energy is very slow so they have a very poor power densities that limit their many many applications on the other side we have a traditional capacitors or a super capacitors which have a very nice power densities they can give us the energy in a seconds and they can store energy in seconds but the energy they store is very limited because they only store energy at their surface so we need something intermediate so and then batteries comes batteries can do something in between between fuel cells and the super capacitors they have energy density high energy density and high power density but still not that much high power that we can use them in our electric vehicles or we can fulfill our dream of our electric flights to reduce the carbon emissions so that's what what future aims we have so for that we need a better electrode materials we need a better electrolyte we need a proper device integrations so all these engineers material scientists and chemists they need to work together to achieve this one so we have a different kind of a batteries depending on their uh, 
uh, whether they are uh, ionic batteries, they are uh, air batteries, there are sulfur batteries, all of them have their issues. So I will a little bit discuss about the ionic batteries in this one. So what happens with the ionic batteries? Normally what happens when we the ions get stored in the material, they create a volume changes or the phase changes in the material. So that ultimately reduce their stability. So how we can improve that stability of the material? So there is a different kind of approaches have been done. Previously it was thinking that if we can reduce the size, we can make nanomaterials. So we can uh, have a more uh, uh, active sites available and less volume changes will happen but what happens creating uh, reducing the size creating uh, many other issues like a thick solid side solid electrolyte interface film formation many side reactions then we move towards 1d we found something better but not very exact and then we move towards the 2d and their composites that give us a lot of benefits higher conductivity higher storage and more stability but still uh, the active materials on 2D sheets or a carbon sheets, they still get deteriorated after some times. So we need some, some such a designs, 3D designs, which connect individual particles. They protect the surface of individual par particles. And then they also cover the overall uh, uh, structure into one uh, conductive mattress that connect direct to the current collector. So overall, we can, can uh, confine everything. We uh, prevent side reactions. We control solar electric interface film. We have an easy penetration of electrolyte. So considering that when we develop some materials, we, uh, we develop uh, cobalt in alloy and tin is very active. It's alloying based material. We put that on a nitrogen doped graphene. So that is highly uh, conductive and also electrochemically active. But what happens normally when we have alloy based materials, the volume change occurs 300%. That's a very high volume change. How we can control that one? To control that one, we need some surface protection. We did some cobalt coating on it. So if you look here, we have a cobalt coating on the surface of the material. So once the cobalt coating is inert, it will not do any side reactions. It will, it's also very tough material. It will also not let a lot of structural changes happen. So ultimately what happens, we have a very exceptional performance of the material for battery. We have a excellent stability. We have excellent rate capability and we have a high uh, capacity storage in the material because we can prevent their structure and we have created extra sites over there. But what happens if we are putting cobalt, which is inactive, so we are giving a dead material to our system, which will not only ultimately reduce the gravimetric uh, or specific capacity, but also impact the volumetric capacity. So we don't want something that is inactive in our system. So we think that if we need only only the uh, surface protection, we can also do this with the nitrogen doped carbon. So we put some nitrogen doped carbon, but what happens? We still found that issue is that electrolyte cannot go inside and still we need some, some of the materials start breaking. So what we did, we break the particles by itself into different phases. If you look at this schematic, you find that we have a different phases in a single particle. We have some tunnel boundaries here, grain boundaries that allow that as a act as a tunnels and allow a, a easily iron to penetrate inside. So we are in fact, what we are doing, we are using the entire particle to get, get uh, energy to be stored over there, as well as we are protecting its surface and we are not letting any changes particle changes happen so if, if you look at then at the uh, its uh, structure uh, structure here you will see that we have a different phases experimentally observed we did xrd and we also confirmed with the edx that the cobalt and tin are distributed as as we want in the structure and then we did electrochemical energy storage in the lithium ion battery and we found that it's it has a more capacity storage capacity than the previous study and it has a more better rate capability that whatever rates you are giving it if you are shifting bad you are shifting higher they are returning to the what actually they should do so that makes that such a design 3d design with the internal engineering of the particle is very useful Uh, so <laughs> there is another example, uh, a similar example, but that was about the particles. If we have a 2D materials, how we can confine them? So for the 2D materials, what we did, we put a uh, conductive matrix inside and then we coat the material on top of it and then we protect it with the carbon. And we found that this kind of a material and if we do this on a, in a sponge, they are even more active towards a higher volumetric capacity because volumetric capacity is also an issue. So we can, 
press them wherever we want to have a size and we can put them in a system and they can have a very high volumetric capacity storage capabilities. So this is another 3D design in the same way where we can incorporate the 3D materials. So this is a, some a few examples about the electron materials in the batteries, sodium and lithium ion batteries. And I will quickly give two examples about the mechanoelectrical conversions. And we all know that what piezoelectrics can do for us, they are they can be utilized into anywhere. They can be a food, uh, smart food pass. They can make a many self-powered devices like a pacemakers. Normally what we need to do, we need Need to have a lot of surgery so that can prevent for that kind and we can have a smart shoes that can generate the energy to power our smart phones and there are so many other acoustic transducers and the delay lines made of these piezoelectric materials so <clears throat> what happens zinc oxide is one of the best material for this this purpose but actually we are not getting a very good performance from the zinc zinc in 2d where we need a something a very thin device to make it shows only where 10 pico uh, picometer of uh, pico volt that is a very small value very small number to, for the efficiency purposes what we did here we develop a new method to prepare ultra thin half a nanometer to several nanometer thick sheets that has a up to centimeters uh, their lateral size they are unidirectional monocrystalline so we preserve their uh, uh, structures and then what we found that these can be very useful when we test their uh, uh, perf uh, performance for piezoelectric coefficient measurements, they were very exceptional. They give us almost eight times better performance. Then we found what happens, why they are giving us such a high performance. When then we th did some theoretical studies. When we did theoretical study, we found that ultra thin zinc oxide is not active. Then why we are getting some performance? And then we further study that why how we can how why we are getting basically why we are getting because we are developing this on a some silicon dioxide silicon dioxide is giving a some distortion in the structure then we further investigate we did again and again experiments and we found that basically a covalent connection between the silicon dioxide and the zinc oxide is the main triggering point that is uh, creating a buckling in the structure and ultimately we are getting such a high performance when we're reducing the size of zinc previously no one has studied this effect that whether thickness uh, reducing the thickness of uh, zinc oxide can give us such a performance so next slide i just show some of the uh, uh, characterization of my material that is uh, you can see it's a very large sheets you can produce millimeter centimeter or even as much as uh, big sheets you want to create from from our method and they are ultra thin they are uh, uh, unidirectional growth and they are highly crystalline and as uh, xps is showing that it has a covalent connection between the zinc oxide and silicon dioxide and if the here you can see some of the pfm characterizations which are showing the phase changes when we are applying a different kind of potential on it and when we plot that one it's giving us the value for a 80 pico uh, meter per volt displacement that is showing the higher uh, coefficient for it and when uh, we then we further study like okay if the reducing thickness is important if we are further reduce the thickness we go up to half a nanometer and we found that when we move from one to half it's again reduce so it means thickness is creating a more and more displacements but there is also some strain and metallic uh, 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 nature of the zinc oxide which is contributing so the best thickness where we compromise all these factors are a 1.1 nanometer and then we extend this one to our another uh, method uh, material that is a tin sulfide normally tin sulfide to get tin sulfide is very difficult 2d tin sulfide but here the same liquid metal method approach we apply here and we easily get the large sheets of a tin sulfide if you look at the characterization there again highly crystalline they have a, a very low thickness and they, and they have a very large surface areas when we uh, did some phase change, uh, pfm studies we found that this is also the same very active material so the, our now our aim is that okay we are developing some materials which are very active so whether they can be really be applicable uh, when we want to put them in some devices, we did some very simple experiment. We put them on, make a device and put them on a finger. We bend and relax the finger, we are getting very high output. 
so that output is going up to a 200 millivolt that is very high output so it means this kind of material when we want to put in a pacemakers they can give us a very exceptional uh, power at least to run the pacemaker they can give us a high power when we put them in shoes to power our cell phones and if we are making this one this material under our footpaths and people are walking on it especially in the big cities where we have a very crowded and high uh, uh, ratio of uh, ratio of uh, uh, humans they are walking on the footpaths we can create even a higher outputs to power our uh, streets over there or even traffic signals or street lights over there so this is this is the way that we are we are developing some materials and we are further now working on these like how we can generate further actual uh, uh, some nano generators that can that can be implemented directly into some uh, applications so that's all and in summary i will just only simply say that nanotechnology really played a very key role in developing uh, and improving and uh, giving us the new technology especially in energy conversion and storage both and especially if we are now because we are already reached the maximum of our individual materials if we are moving next and we are making their heterostructures we can even further improve their properties at the end i would acknowledge my students and research associate and the collaborators and most important funders who give us the funding to do this research and uh, thank you